right, what is up, what is up? This is RC Apologist with another episode of the Vantillion Thinker here. All right, let me make sure to see if I can adjust this microphone without getting a disconnect. All right, there we go. We should be good for that. All right, time to go into today's topic, and it's going to be an interesting one. Probably going to get some flack for it by some people, depending on what their particular views are, but... Who knows? We shall see as we are going straight into the topic about logic as it relates to the, uh, the Christian and how even in other religious circles nowadays it seems that this issue and topic has become a bit of a controversy. It's become a bit of a thing that has even become too sort of sensitive to discuss because of the fact that we are trying to you know, be logical thinkers, especially in an age where some people have tried to claim that religion, specifically Christianity, is uh, for the illogical. But the thing that I have uh, come to notice and come to have seen is in the fact that with people who decide to make this particular claim... And even sometimes some people that try to almost imply this while being religious themselves, they come into some problems. So the main thing to discuss in this regard is those who then kind of take this advice or take this regard saying, you know, you need to study philosophy and logic instead of specifically what your religion or what your Bible teaches or whatever, you know, what you have on you. Um, and it is because of that that usually what you'll have from a lot of people these days is videos or essays simply entitled theism proven true theism defended proof that uh, generic god exists you know all these sorts of things i mean this is where like for example with you know some people such as inspiring philosophy invoking theism um and a few others, um, what was his name, uh, because uh, he had a particular, uh, view that he was, um, uh, adhering to, but, uh, a guy by the name of Kyle, who has, a, a particular channel, um, but point is that there are several people out there these days that are mostly making, um, you know, some videos proving certain parts of the Bible to be, you know, um, true within regard. But when it comes to the question of trying to demonstrate a certain God that exists or defending the validity of a particular religion, it is more so nowadays reduced to a generality of it. And some of the things that are usually seen with some of these people now, I'm not accusing this of the people that I've named but more so of the people that usually end up following them because these are normally the people that, let's face it, will be more so into these kinds of discussions in an open forum or a public forum when it comes to, you know, maybe like leaving a comment or something like that. That's really what you engage in or what you see from some of them is this. So that being said, the main issue is that the laws of logic usually are put into a particular position in rank and authority that they are either indirectly referred to and utilized as the ultimate standard of all things and therefore has God being put under the measurement and under the criticism by the laws of logic or they will put them onto an equal authority with the laws of logic. And this is not just a thing that happens as well for the Christians. I mean, one of the things that I've noticed with some particular Muslim apologists, and hence why, honestly, there's, you know, reasons why I start to them question if I should get involved with them, because at that point I would know then kind of how the conversation would go at this point. And that is, for example, with people like Muhammad Hijab, um, Jake the Muslim metaphysician um, these are people that 
would basically be all about logic and philosophy, but they don't particularly have it to the point that, you know, their creed or their um, ultimate standard with the Quran and their faith come into the ultimate play of things, but especially for the case of Jake, and, I, you know, I said, dude's a good guy, I've talked with him before, but he, from what I've seen in some of the recent videos that have come out, as well as just, you know, how some of the Muslims have carried into reception when talking and engaging in private discussions or public discussions, there is the issue that comes about where, ultimately, he is letting the laws of logic be the ultimate standard, and even to the point that, therefore, by the laws of logic, therefore, we interpret and understand who God is, and therefore, that's how we can view God. Even from the Muslim standard of the Quran and the Hadith, this is just problematic, but then at the same time, this also leads to a problem where, you know, even the majority of Muslim scholars um, have commented on this matter, especially scholars of the fiqh regarding the jurisprudence. Um, there's apparently what is in certain scholars from these different uh, schools of jurisprudence that have commented on it. from, And they're major scholars from what I've looked into according to what the website had given that state that Islam... Uh, discourages the studying of philosophy unless to study it so that you critique philosophy as a whole. Um, but that being said, so going back to the Christian then, what becomes the problem then, you know, when they make this particular kind of statement? When they try to go about, okay, you know, we're going to, you know, we're trying to defend the faith, but we want to use logic. But what happens when you just continuously use logic without trying to make your appeal to ultimately to the Bible and having God or the scriptures as your ultimate standard at that point? One of the comments that I wanted to point out to is an interesting one by Cornelius Van Til, and this is found in page 33 through 34 of the second edition of the Introduction to Systematic Theology by... Uh, Cornelius Van Til, so Prolegom Prolegomena and the Doctrines of Revelation, Scripture, and God. This is what Van Til states. Quote, As man's existence is dependent upon an act of voluntary creation on the part of God, so man's knowledge depends upon an act of voluntary revelation of God to man. Even the voluntary creation of man is already a revelation of God to man. Thus, wait a minute, that was actually the wrong particular note. So, yeah, lost my place there. So, sorry about that. Starting from the top, this is actually pages 31 through 32. Starting here, in contrast to this, Christianity holds that God existed alone before any time existence was brought forth. He existed as the self-conscious and self consistent being the law of contradiction therefore as we know it is but the expression on a created level of the internal coherence of god's nature so we see that there is the correlation with the law of god with who god is and that is the law of contradiction as well regarding the notion of how god is then to be understood regarding it reflecting his nature so law of contradiction is not god but as it states we know it is but an expression on a created level of the internal coherence of God's nature. Going on with the quote, Christians should therefore never appeal to the law of contradiction as something that as such determines what can or cannot be true. And to continue further with it, Paramendes serves as a warning of what happens to history if the law of contradiction is in this fashion made the ultimate standard of appeal in human thought. Permanentes concluded that to understand anything historical, it would have to be reduced to an element in a timeless system of categories. He therefore denied the reality and significance of all historical plurality. In modern times, it is customary to use the law of contradiction of, uh, negatively rather than positively, as Permanentes did. On the surface, this appears to leave room for historical faculty or factuality, but it does so only if this 
historical factuality be thought of be as being unknowable or irrational. So to go a few bit, bit of the uh, footnotes that have been put into here by William Edgar on the notion regarding the statement that we should not appeal to the law of contradiction as something that can determine what can or cannot be true. What is meant by this? Quote, this view stands in strong contrast to the so-called classical apologetics, which is partially what we would refer to. And again, it says so-called classical apologetics because, personally, I don't think it really is as classical as it sounds. Which absolutizes the law of contradiction, despite claims to ground it in the deity. Thus, Van Til here, and throughout, is fond of saying that there is equal ultimacy of the one and the many derived from the trinity. Strictly, according to Aristotle's absolute laws of logic, this would be impossible. So, there is the notion that comes about when one tries to make appeals to the laws of logic, and that if you supposedly go to the triune God, according to some of these particular ancient philosophers, you would have been in the wrong for it. In other words, if someone is trying to become a philosopher, utilize the laws of logic, but they are a triune Christian, then Aristotle would eventually kind of have a problem with you. That's essentially kind of how that would go about. So we have to realize that there is distinctions based on utilizing these laws of logic dependent upon the worldview that you particularly adopt as you examine this. And then regarding Paramendes, you know, he's the most important pre-Socratic philosopher, believed that uh, what is real is one, indivisible, and motionless. Um, so in other words, basically, he is affirming in terms of the logical problem of the one and the many that is stated that the logical problem of the one and the many, the answer is the one. There is the monism, but this would lead to problems, as is stated earlier, and as well as it would ultimately leave everything to be in universals and therefore not in particulars regarding how we can have knowledge of certain things. And knowledge of certain things is reduced merely to categories or universals instead of particulars and distinctions that we make. They would say that the distinctions and particulars are fabrications that we utilize. But, continuing on with the particular quote, it says, Christians should learn or should employ the law of contradiction, whether positively or negatively, as a means by which to sorry about this, systematize the facts of revelation, whether these facts are found in the universe at large or in the scripture. The law of contradiction cannot be thought of as operating anywhere except against the background of the nature of God. Since therefore God created this world, it would be impossible that this created world should ever furnish an element of reality on a par with him. The concept of creation as entertained by Christians makes the idealist notion of logic once for all impossible. The creation doctrine is implied in the God concept of Christianity. Deny the creation doctrine, and you have denied the Christian concept of God. So, in other words, I think that'll be enough from that particular uh, quote here, but you can read the rest of it. In an introduction to systematic theology, second edition by Cornelius Van Til. I recommend the second edition because the footnotes by William Edgar help clear a lot of um, notes and conversation that is discussed on the matter. But what Van Til says there is very interesting, very thought provoking, and we should really be considerate of what is being said there because. When we have Christians that are coming about um, and trying to utilize the laws of logic, and they are doing so almost in a way as if to treat it as, you know, then this is the means by how we, you know, observe and interpret reality to the point that even it now becomes how we then interpret and understand God in light of the laws of logic and not uh, by the ultimate authority that is God himself. So it would either put to the point that the laws of logic are on the ult equal uh, ultimacy with God, being that they are equally ultimate in authority, and this, I would argue, would be a problematic view, if anything. And then you have the issue regarding uh, if it's higher than God in authority and therefore that's really the problematic because then this would have to discuss 
okay, would it be created or not created? If it's created, then how can something that is created be of a higher authority and power than God in that regard? The God that created the laws of logic. But if they are eternal and have not been created, then this also begs the question then of what exactly are these laws and how do we have this particular knowledge of them to be as this? So there would be another issue that would be needed to be pointed out. So that being said, what I think we need to ask is why then do some people do this when they engage in conversations with, say, um, the atheist at that point? Because then, you know, the atheist is mostly going to ask questions about, you know, how then does the Bible relate to this? Because, you know, we are Christians, we believe the Bible, and we get to the notion of the triune God in light of the scriptures. And some people are trying to go kind of around this. They try to steer clear from the Bible at this point. And I don't know why, when they're supposed to be defending it. Just like when some of these people like are questioning the Quran, they try to go around it. Because here's the... <sighs> Here's the thing, like a lot of people, and I hate kind of keep bringing this up, but that's the thing that I've noticed in my discussions and getting involved in that particular debate is that when some people in the Christian versus Islam debate would be making a deal, they would basically say, you know, we're going to do code for the Quran. If the Bible ever gets attacked or gets met with a criticism, never respond to the criticism, but instead point out, well, don't you know that in the Quran it says this? And don't you know in the Quran it says that? Without at any point trying to defend what the Bible um, states. This is why some of the people such as uh, Christian Prince, um, J. Smith, uh, the people over there at the Speaker's Corner go by DCCI Ministries and a few others are like that. They don't really try to defend the Bible when it has come onto a challenge. But then again, Speaker's Corner produces a toxic environment that is bound to happen. So hence why some of these people that are there on the quote-unquote Christian side act like this. And then you have the same thing with the Muslims. Some of these Muslims that are over there end up begin engaging in toxic behavior and begin engaging in behavior that basically states, Well, you know... You say this about the Quran, but did you know your Bible says this and your Bible says that? And they refuse to acknowledge what they get into with that. And they will even do the point because they're trying to point out, you know, how to deal with these things logically. You know, they try to assume neutral ground like some of these people do. But neutral ground or neutrality in terms of this particular kind of topic does not exist. There is no neutrality. That is what is known as the myth of neutrality. There is just no neutral, generic, general concept of theism or anything on a particular position. Now, mind you, it's not necessarily a dilemma of, you know, it's either this way or that way. There's definitely going to be other options in terms of what a position must be on the particular matter, but none of them are neutral by any means. It's a position that you are adhering to and holding to. It's going to make a statement, and the other one's not going to make a statement um, that agrees with the others. So, there's differences in the manner. So, you see this in the Muslims in Speaker's Corner. You see this in some of these quote-unquote Christians at the Speaker's Corner. And even online, you'll see this issue happen. That it's, okay, laws of logic, we're, using, we're utilizing logic and philosophy as ultimate authority. Now, mind you, I will utilize philosophical arguments. I will utilize the laws of logic as a Christian myself. But I realize that there is a submission to understanding and interpreting these laws of logic. Because while these, while logic exists, it is still a created thing. And it is a thing that we as humans are trying to analyze and understand from our knowledge, from our finite knowledge as human beings created in the image of God. So with that in mind... How then do we go about, you know, 
demonstrating this particular case is that we can make. You know, how can we be Christians that make an argument? Well, you could, first of all, just simply make the argument. But keep in mind that when you make an argument, it's ultimately rooted in uh, what I would refer to as the transcendental kind of argument. So in other words, not so simply, you know, the impossibility of the contrary, as Greg Bonson and Van Til would kind of point out. But rather, what I would point out, sorry about that, sorry for the pauses, I'm just uh, trying to check up on a couple of things, it is uh, alone time here at the, uh, <coughs> at the uh, apartment, so it'll be, not, not apartment, but mobile home, you get the point, but yeah, you know, you kind of hear a few things, and especially with the uh, Squirrels have been kind of out here and there, so you'll occasionally kind of might probably hear them on the mic at times, but with that being said, going to the issue about trying to form the argument. We make the argument, but we use it in a transcendental thing. Basically, let me give an explanation instead of just repeating myself at this point. So say you want to utilize the moral argument. Well, okay. You have to utilize the fact that there is the moral argument in light of what is the standard for that for what ethics is so first of all you definitely have objective morality must be utilized in that and one of these examples is one that I actually kind of used myself one that I've constructed in trying to make the particular wording now some of y'all may disagree with me and that's fine that's totally fine but I want y'all to take a note here on exactly what is the argument that is being um, stated. Hold on a second. Apparently something just happened and I am going to need to... Because I'm trying to pull up where the actual argument is itself that I can formulate here. All right, so here we go. So, and again, one of the things that is used for these, you can even use multiple arguments to try to go by a point-by-point -point system on the argument. So, one of the things that I would use is this argument. That is, premise one, any moral or ethical statement that is considered obligatory. In other words, that is something that is a must, that you need to do this, that compelled to be doing this it must have an objective or universal authority so in other words in order for it to be considered something that is a obligation to do this implies some sense of that it must be obligatory that it must be done regarding this ethical statement or moral statement it has to have an objective or universal authority with atheism, there is no objective or universal authority. That's premise two. The conclusion is, therefore, there is no obligatory power behind moral or ethical statements in the atheist worldview. Now, this is a simplified, just general kind of notion, but if you begin with the notion of the Christian God and put that into mind, then you can at least even expend, extend the argument, or even add another argument, pointing out that with uh, God, there is, you know, objective, universal notions of statements because of what is implied by this as a universal authority or an objective authority. The ethical laws that are given unto us Christians um, have come from this universal or objective authority. Therefore, they have an objective or universal authority and therefore moral and ethical statements are followed from this. So we point out the issue of the biblical account and the biblical notion of God in light of the argument. Now, you could either just make a second argument and utilize that similar thing that I just stated there, or you can just simply point out after making this, explaining then what is the power behind what then can actually make objective or universal authority statements. Now, this is not breaking the laws of logic by any means, but rather is showing that we subject the laws of logic to being interpreted in light of a particular lens. In this case, the lens of that is that of the triune God. 
And people could say, well, then the uh, Unitarian, um, the Muslim, the Buddhist, and the Hindu, they, the, all these different people can utilize that same kind of logic. They can try to say, well, this is how it should be interpreted in there, for that's how I go for it. And I would say, yeah, that's the point. Do that. But ultimately what's going to happen if you follow it to its logical conclusion is that it's going to be reduced to absurdity at that point. And the reason why it would be reduced to absurdity is due to the fact that they're based even on their own principles they're going to deal with logical problems logical fallacies that just render it to absurdity like i've said earlier before there was the issue about the uh argument from deduction on unitarianism and therefore a reputation against islam at that point then there's the issue about the logical problem of the one and the many an issue that some people cannot answer and one of those um, people, I mean, I talked to Jake about this, and he would say it himself, as a guy who even is, this kind of just shows you, like, where he doesn't, does not get to grasp some of these certain things, that he couldn't account for the logical problem of the one and the many, because he says no one can, Islam can't, Christianity can't, uh, Hinduism can't, Buddhism can't, atheism can't, no one can account for the logical problem of the one and the many. And this to me just seems like a bit of a cop out. It is ultimately saying, you know, I can't think of a solution to it, and I don't want to fall clearly into what is going to obviously be the case for that of the Islamic position. Because honestly, the logical um, following and conclusion of what the solution would be according to Islam is that of Unitarianism. And that is, therefore, the oneness, that reality is ultimately one. But the problem with this is, again, what I noted earlier about, and hence why even to the point that whenever he tried to deal with this problem, a certain philosopher by the name of Ibn Sina went so far with this notion of monism that the idea that Allah is truly and completely one regarding Unitarianism, that he even stated that God's knowledge... That God's knowledge does not relate or comprehend or understand particulars. How would you want to go with the wording on that? But the notion is that he doesn't, that the knowledge does not relate to or deal with particulars. In other words, with category, or not categories, with distinctions, with particular individuals. It's all unity and therefore universals at that point. And because of this, you know, there was what one website had noted about this until he eventually recanted. This was one of the things that considered Ibn Sina a heretic that got him out of the fold of Islam. And even with some Christians, this can be a similar thing that happens. Because some people will do this. I mean, to me, I wouldn't say full on heretic, but Gordon Clark was another clear example where he even did so to the point that it was like God is logic and therefore this can be put there but at the same time there's still the distinction between God and then the laws of logic so it got him to a point where he was starting to think some interesting stuff needless to say so and I don't know the same thing is starting to be seen with some of these other Christians that are out there is that ultimately they're stating that you know logic is something that must be judged or that it is able to judge God because that's how we should understand God and therefore that's how we should try to come up with these certain analogies that are probably going to disagree with biblical notions and concepts and thus we should interpret the Bible in light of logic, we should interpret God in light of logic, we should interpret Christianity in light of the laws of logic as ultimate authority. And to me this is just a problem because what it does is just make a case that states, well, that ultimately we are serving creation and worshiping creation in a sense as ultimate authority in a similar sense that Romans 1 had warned us about. But, what do you know? That's just my two cents on it. With that being said, I'm going to get going. Y'all take care and enjoy yourselves. This has been RC Apologist. Enjoy. Enjoy.